And I'd like to welcome everybody once again to the Buffalo History Channel. It is good to be back. It's good to have you all with us. I was, many of you will know I was in Buffalo a few weeks ago helping to celebrate the um, 46th annual Juneteenth Festival. I'm uh, wearing, wearing the t-shirt here. It was a great time and had a great time in Buffalo, met up, met, got to see a lot of people, uh, participated in many of the various Juneteenth festivities and activities that were going on in the city. I'd like to thank you all for also tuning into the channel, subscribing, binge watching, <laughs> and watching some of the uh, latest editions like 67 Buffalo Uprising on the Buffalo Riot. Also, um, we just po we just recently today posted the video, the, the third original production on Jim Bell Cleaners. Jim Bell Cleaners, the true story of black power. So thank you for uh, subscribing to the channel and watching the content. Now, I am very, very pleased and very, very honored to have this gentleman with us today. Uh, his name is Edward Lawrence. Some may, may remember him as one of the directors of the African Cultural Center. That's right, we are going to talk about the history behind the African Cultural Center. It is one of the prominent Buffalo institutions of black arts within the city. And who better to bring you the story than the, than the gentleman that is sitting here today. He is uh, very accomplished in the arts himself. He himself is a renowned actor as well. We'll talk about his acting career. I would like to welcome Mr. Edward Lawrence to the Buffalo History Channel. Mr. Lawrence, welcome. Hey, Derek, how are you? Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely, absolutely. And hello to everyone. Absolutely, it's good to have you with us. So um, before we get into the, the history of the uh, African Cultural Center, I said, you, I said you yourself are an actor and you're of the arts. Uh, talk to us about your acting career and what you've been involved in, starting out. Okay, Doug, I got started as an actor when I was a kid. My brother, Jesse Lawrence, used to take me to the movies. And uh, at the foot of Main Street there in Buffalo were three movie houses. The Academy, the Keith, the Keith, and the Little Hippodrome. And every Wednesday night, my brother was a delivery boy for the Buffalo Evening News. He got paid on Wednesday. Every Wednesday night after dinner, we'd head for the movies. And I got carried away by the movies. And after, I, after so many trips to the movies with my brother, Jesse, I said I wanted to be an actor because I saw the good guy and the bad guy. And the good guy always won the girls and always came out on top. So I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> I was going to be the first black Tarzan. <laughs> okay. That's how all that started. So um, after graduation, we went to grammar school and high school and after graduation from Hutch Tech. And uh, I got interested and went to the studio theater school in 19, we got out of high school in 57, I mean 55. 1957, I was signing up for acting classes at the studio theater school out on Hoyt in, in Buffalo, New York there, down the street from the hospital. Millard Fillmore Hospital was nearby. But I went in there to sign up for the classes and the place was packed, people signing up for acting classes in September that year. And uh, I noticed I was the only black person there. So I said, maybe, maybe I need to check this out. Maybe I don't need to be here now. So I got up and was leaving because I was one of the, the first people to arrive. Place packed up quick. I got up and I was leaving and I heard a voice say, young man, young man, just before I was getting out the door, said, where are you going? I said, well, uh, I said, well, she says, you go right back in there and sign up for class if you're interested in the theater and becoming an actor. 
that lady turned out to be the founder director of the of the school, Studio Theater School, Miss Jane Keeler. She made me go back in there and sign up for classes. There were two two young brothers there earlier, African American brothers, Joe Mayo and his brother John. But I was the first black actor in the uh, Studio Arena Professional School on Buffalo. And uh, it was a quite a wonderful experience. Okay. Now, I, I was in rehearsal one day. Malcolm and I, Bill Bailey and I were kids together in grammar school. I was in rehearsal one day at the Studio Theater School there. I mean, the Studio Arena Theater when it became a professional theater on Main Street. I was playing a sailor in one of the musicals. And somebody came to me and said, Mr. Lawrence, you got a phone call. And I said, I got a phone call? And they said, yes, it says the surgeon. And I went to the phone and got there in the back of the theater there. And it was not other than Malcolm and I on the phone to me saying, you're up there playing, us playing a sailor in those musicals and things up there with those white people. And I need you to come down here and start a black theater. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, Malcolm, I didn't, I didn't know you had those things in mind. Start a theater. I said, well, Malcolm, I said, these people are paying me. Well, we can pay you something. We're going to be getting some funding from the United Way. So I went home that evening and discussed it with my mother and father. My father said, well, you know, I'm working every day. I'm, I'm a nine to five man. You need to talk that over with Malcolm and your mother. And my mother said to me, well, you know, that's all good and well that you're down there working with those people, but Malcolm wants you to come down to the center and work with him and start a black theater. I think you need to consider that. And then my mother, see, uh, I don't know about your mother, but my mother, I don't know if you remember the prize fight of Joe Lewis, great, great yeah. champion. Me and my two brothers, and, and my sister, especially my two brothers, we used to listen to Joe Lewis' prize fights all the time. Well, my mother could hit like Joe Lewis. <laughs> my mother said to me, go in the bathroom and look at the tone of your skin. I said, you need to go down there and work with Mel and start helping start that theater. And that's how that all came about. When was the center founded, exactly? Uh, the center was founded in 1970, 1958, okay. Malcolm and I, Bill Bailey and myself, we were kids in grammar school. That's how it all started. I've heard that, you know, we, 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 we many of us in Buffalo have, have heard the name of Malcolm Erni. For sadly, he's no longer with us today. Talk to us about the type of man. Who was Malcolm Erni, the man in your own words? Okay. It all started in public school number six, in grammar school. It was three young men that hung out together and did a lot of things together. The first young man was Malcolm Erna. The second young man was Ed Lawrence, myself. The third young man was a young man named Bill Bailey. We just lost Bill recently in the last two or three weeks. He passed away. But we all had aspirations of going to Tech High School and become architects. So when we graduated from grammar school, we had good leadership at grammar school. The principal was a white man named Dr. Gordon Williams. I mean, Dr. Gordon Higgins. Dr. Gordon Higgins. I checked his history. He was like the eighth president at public school number six. Dr. Higgins loved the music. And he let us be, I became an actor because I was interested in the theater because of my brother taking me to the movies all the time. And Malcolm and I and Bill Bailey did the scenery at public school number six. When we graduated, which was in 1951, it's amazing I can remember all this stuff all after all these years. We graduated and went into Hutch Tech High School. Hutch Tech became Hutch Tech after Hutchison High School closed. Malcolm dropped out of school in his sophomore year, went south to study the ministry. Bill Bailey and I stayed in school. And in 1955, we uh, graduated from high school. 
By 1958, Malcolm and I was back in Buffalo in the basement of a church. He had started an organization for kids to learn their history and be proud of their skin tone. And the name of that organization was the African Cultural Center. He eventually moved over to 350 Masted Avenue, where they are now. And I told you, he called me one day while I was in rehearsal at the studio theater school, I mean, at the studio arena, and asked me to come down there and join him and start a black theater. And that's what we did. We started a black theater at the African Cultural Center in 1970, 1970. Three of them. No, 1971. Was what, was the, what was the purpose for the, for the center towards the community? The center was founded by Malcolm and I to teach Black youth their history and to be proud of their skin tone. The great R&B singer James Brown sang the song, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Malcolm and I did the deed. As far as I know, Malcolm used to talk to me privately and Malcolm would say things like, we came from royalty. Our people were kings and queens in Africa. And we had to be proud of who we are. And this racism is, is killing us, is hurting us. We need to do something about it. Teach black youth their history and their culture and be proud of it. And that's how that all got started. Okay, Mr. Lawrence, I was reading and researching some art re by reading some articles about the uh, early articles about the early history of the center. And um, it said two things that stuck out to me that when you were there, you know, the kid, how the children used to just rush up to you and they were just really excited about what they were going to just come into the center and learn today. And also the article states that when they entered the center, it's just interesting that you have that picture in the back of you. Um, they would, when they entered the center, they would be greeted by the picture that's in the back of you. Could you talk to us about that picture? That picture came about when uh, the board of directors at the center said, we're gonna have to do something about Malcolm because the United Way is threatening to pull the trial funding. We, was on, we were being funded on a trial basis. And Malcolm hadn't been paying the bills. Malcolm wasn't handling. That's the only problem I saw with Malcolm Erna. He couldn't handle money well. He certainly could handle his history and his dedication and his love. So I don't want anybody to think that when I left the center or when I took over Malcolm's place, that I had anything to do with Malcolm being terminated. I had absolutely nothing about Malcolm being terminated. I told him, I used to talk to him about that money and see, now when you start paying these bills and they're doing it right, you're using that money in the wrong way. And Malcolm had, couldn't handle money well. And that's what happened then. Now, did I answer your question or did I get away from it? Um, no, not really. Um, did what the was, chill, the, well, I wanted to talk, first talk about the, the sign that's in the, the picture that's in the back of you. Because yeah. you said that when people would enter the building, they yeah. would be greeted by that sign. What does that sign say, by the way? That sign says, the black youth of this nation must, should, and will have the best this nation has to offer because their foreparents have earned them the right. And that came from me being coming in there as a new director. I had a statement to make. And I wanted to make it that way. And much to my pleasure, guess who wrote that sign? My sister-in-law says that, brother, if you write it, I'll print it. And she was Japanese. Wow, that's the, okay. That's the history of that sign. Yeah. Okay. So you take over the center as um, director from succeeding Malcolm Erni. Talk to us about um, what your vision for the center was at the time of, of your, of your leadership? My vision was Malcolm Ernest's vision. Teach black history, teach black pride, 
teach those children to be proud of their skin tone and to let's keep it going. And that's what I did until they called in there one day, called me in there one day and fired me on the spot. After eight and a half years, we had black history classes going, arts and craft classes going, sewing classes going. We were doing the job and Malcolm was proud. But now, when I, when I took over the center, I lost contact with Malcolm. As a matter of fact, I think there was there were those that thought I had something to do with him being terminated. Not true, not true, and an ounce of tr truth to it. And so when Malcolm died, they wrote an article in the Buffalo Criterion. On the front page, they had his picture. And uh, the lady that wrote that article, Miss Doyle, Miss Eva Doyle. Her article, her, her column was called Eye on History. She stated there through that article dedicated to Malcolm that Malcolm Erna and the board of directors went out and got the money to buy that property there at the center. I can emphatically tell you right now, talking to you, no truth to that statement at all. When that center was purchased, Malcolm and I was not the executive director of the center. I was. And the man that got that money was William Bailey. The three of us grew up together from grammar school and high school. Bill Bailey by that time had become a very important banker at Marine Midland Bank. Bill got a grant from the Buffalo Foundation, setting a record straight now, because the Buffalo Criterion that lady, Miss Doyle, all those do respect to Miss Doyle, she was misinformed. Bill Bailey got that grant to purchase that property. And Bill Bailey was not a, a black man that, that sought any kind of recognition. He was more interested in getting the job done than being recognized for doing the job. I said, well, Bill, why don't you let people, well, we don't, that's not important. The important thing is to buy this property so the Senate could go on with this teaching of black history to the youth. And I have to agree with him. And that's what happened there. Okay. Um, right, right now, you, you said you wanted to, you had a couple people that you wanted to uh, include on the interview. Um, your, your daughter and as well as your, your production manager, are they with you right now? Yes. Like, like to bring them in. Yeah, I'd like to bring them in now and let you meet him. Yes. My production coordinator, Mr. Jasper Magruder. What's the Russ? Hi, how you doing, Doug? How are you, Mr. Magruder? I'm doing fine, thank you. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Okay, so talk. you were the, the production stage manager. Talk to us about what, first of all, what, what brought you to the um, African Cultural Center back in the well, day? Well, I, my... First, the first time I was at the African Cultural Center was in 1970. Okay. Uh, my sister, whose name is Phyllis uh, Chase or Phyllis Magruder, she taught in the Buffalo School System, and she also ran the Jefferson uh, Education Center. Okay. So this was in the late 60s, early uh, uh, early uh, 70s. So I come from. Uh, the southern tier of uh, New York. Okay. Around Ithaca, Elmira, a small town called Waverly, about 5,000 people. Okay. And my family had been there since the 1850s. Uh, my great grandfather was born in slavery, and in his journey, he wound up uh, in that area in, uh, in the 1850s. And my uh, Mother and father, they met in the 1930s, had 14 children, and we went through the school system. And for the most part, each of my brothers and sisters were the only black kid in their class from kindergarten to uh, high school to uh, 12th grade. Right. So going to, uh, I was going to go to Fredonia. So the spring of uh, 1970, I uh, moved to uh, Buffalo with my uh, sister, and I happened to uh, see a flyer for a play at the African Cultural Center 
called So Gone Home by uh, Langston Hughes and Zoo Story by uh, Edward uh, Elby. And I'd never seen black performers on the stage, uh, you know, live. Right. So uh, I went to the uh, performance and went back the next day. I was so enthralled for an acting workshop and wound up getting a, uh, doing a one act play called uh, Metaphors by uh, Martin Duberman, which was like a college interview kind of a situation. Okay. So I went on to uh, I went on to college. I was going to major in business. After the first year, I realized I was going to be hanging around the same uh, people that I just left in the uh, in the uh, industry, you know, uh, area manufacturing. So I switched my major from business to theater. Got a degree, and in 1975, I uh, applied uh, to the center for a job as a production stage manager, and they gave it to me. So I worked there from about June of 1970 into 1975 into uh, the uh, winter of 76 into uh, January. And uh, I just uh, loved the uh, place. It talk was talk about some of the plays. Do you remember what, what was it like? What was it like to work with some of the plays? Or do you do you remember any of the plays that you worked on? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just worked about the metaphors was the first play. And when I got back as a production stage manager, I uh, in 70 uh, in 75, I did uh, I did a play by uh, Douglas uh, Turner uh, Ward, which uh, what's the name of that uh, piece? Uh, Douglas Turner Ward. Ha oh, Happy Ending. Happy OK. And uh <laughs> with a director from New York by the name of uh, Bill Delarno. And what impressed me about the uh, theater aspect of the Cultural Center was that uh, Mr. Lawrence brought in some of the top uh, play black playwrights and, uh, and directors from uh, New York, you know, for his uh, production. So it was, even though it was a community center, they had a regional kind of uh, uh, mentality in right. terms of their search and bringing people uh, in. But other than that, on a day-to-day -day basis, there were all these uh, children uh, coming in, they had dance classes, they uh, were getting uh, tutoring, uh, they were performing all over the uh, city. So it was just alive and I just enjoyed uh, uh, being there. And, uh, you know, they had uh, uh, toy drives which we went around the community and got toys and black, white, everyone from Buffalo was really contributing to this cause. So it was really, Mr. Lawrence produced an environment where the children really uh, came uh, first. And uh, I think what happens when you're totally dedicated to that, you have a board of directors and for the most part, he wasn't even thinking about them. He was doing what he wanted to do and you know as well as I do is that, yeah. you know, you have to uh, nurture a board just like you do a newborn baby. Right. They want to be changed. They want to be kissed. They want to be hugged. And if that isn't done, then, uh, you know, they're going to find some reason to uh, get rid of you. Right. And the reality is, I think, is that they really don't need any reason at all. Boards can pretty much within their own constitutions, do what they uh, have to do. So it's very difficult to overturn uh, their uh, decisions, particularly right. if they give you no reason. Right. Let's say they tell you, well, you're doing everything great, we love you, but we just want to make a change. And that's a very common thing for boards to do to uh, individuals, whether they deserve it or not. Right. And in this case, it was the uh, latter. But I thoroughly enjoyed there. I, uh, you know, I, I keep that in my heart. And I'm still friends with some of the children that were at his uh, center uh, from uh, the 1976. And when I came to New York, mm -hmm. uh, the center children came to New York. So I was able to take them to some theaters here in uh, New York, the New Federal Theater, uh, kind of show them around town. But uh, without uh, Mr. Lawrence at the uh, helm, uh, it wouldn't have gotten uh, done. And it's unfortunate that in terms of the 
history of the uh, center, somehow uh, they kind of scratched uh, his name off of some very important aspects of it. And uh, a big part of that was in the same year that you had that shirt on, he and uh, William Bally, who also wrote a, a book, uh, by the way, which chronicles his life in uh, Buffalo and his uh, childhood. But in 1976, they purchased the uh, property. And uh, now, uh, you know, the African Cultural Center really has a uh, home. And they don't have to worry about that aspect. They just have to concern themselves with giving the children the uh, best that we uh, possibly can. Granted, it's not 1970 anymore. It's 2020, 2021. So there's a whole other aspect, just like you and I are talking. We can right. get our uh, children to uh, Africa today on, on a daily basis. So there are a lot of tools today that can be used that uh, weren't even available 50 years ago. And hopefully the current you know, administration understands the importance of uh, nurturing our uh, Black children and giving them a sense of pride and a direction at a very early age. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. Next year we'll uh, you know, meet again or talk again. Absolutely, and absolutely. I love that artwork behind you. Uh, this is actually just, uh, this was a background that I ordered a few years ago just to add to videos. Actually, I'm, I'm in the process of getting an actual Buffalo History Channel Urban Legacy background, so, that background will soon change in, in due time. Well, that's great. It's great talking to you. Good talking to you as well. Okay, I'd like to bring in the daughter, Jill Lawrence. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's good. Nice to meet meet you. Likewise, likewise. Okay. Let me just say right out, coming right out of the floodgates right now. I was at the time, at the time. I was like four years old or something. So okay. <laughs> I, I can't say that I was like part of what was going on there beyond me being up under his desk at times and getting involved in this, that, and the third as a little a little brat. <laughs> <laughs> but it did it didn't it, but it did in turn introduce you to the world of acting. And for my audience, I'm I am talking to his daughter, Jill Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are were also on, what was the, the show that you that you are best known for being on? Oh, Law and Order Special Victims Unit as Attorney Cleo Conrad. Okay, we see we have a got a celebrity in the building. No. <laughs> okay, well we can talk. What you can? I mean, you were young, too young. I guess you since you were too young to remember being being there at the time. Um, certainly, you can let us know about what got what got you how you got yourself got into acting, because I'm sure the center certain and your father certainly had an influence. Well, you know what, I, I will say this, um, about uh, the, the, the big aha moment in terms of my father and his legacy um, and the contribution that he made to the community. I will say that um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, we planned a a big um, surprise 75th birthday party for him. And so um, I uh, was getting together the guest list for that, uh, that event and um, got in contact with uh, Agnes Bain. She's no longer with us. She was my dad's secretary for many years while he was there. And um, at the time when I contacted her, she was the director of the African Cultural Center, which was 2009. And um, I have to say I had a, a big, uh, I guess you could say, aha moment. Um, and it was a big revelation for me. Um, once I did get in contact with many of the kids that were part of the fabric of that community at that time, uh, you know, my father with his administrative skills and all of the programs and the things that he had been generating out of that center they really made a, a big footprint in their lives um and that's when i really discovered um you know the contributions that was being made to the community then i mean it was a arts and crafts program it was a a wood shop 
program for the young, young, young men that would come in after school. There was a sewing class going on. There was a senior citizens uh, a program. Um, he would have, you know, the African Culture Center would generate clothing drives, toy drives, food drives during, particularly at the peak of the holiday season. And um, so when I got connected with all of those people who were, again, young kids, um, it was, as I said, a, a big aha for me, um, the contributions that was being made to the community back then. And I have to readily testify and say that while the African Cultural Center is there now, those, all of those kinds of initiatives and drives and programs are not operating like that. It's, it's really primarily a theater um, that's functioning on the property, but um, it would be nice to revisit that dynamic again, um, all of those programs that was happening back then. So that is, that's my knowledge. Mm -hmm. which is based on what other people, their, their narratives and their stories and their experiences that they were sharing with me as I was getting this guest list together for his 75th birthday party. Okay, well, for our audience, um, your acting career, could you talk to us about what some of, some of the other roles that you've played and what, would lead, what led up to you being on Law well, & Order? Okay, um, well, I'm, I'm classically trained. Um, from the um, Yale School of Drama and um, really coming right out of the floodgates. I started working right away. Um, uh, I graduated in 1997. And um, just as many actors start out, you come to one of the world's most expensive cities and you're trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to keep your head above water and, and survive. And I just, I really, uh, you know, I, I had my agents coming, like I said, right out of school, I, I had agents and all of that. And I just got on the audition circuit and, you know, it was a hustle, you know, for the first year, yeah. year or so. And then I landed a role on a Law & Order Special Victims Unit as attorney Cleo Conrad. And then it uh, parlayed into other opportunities. Um, I've done various things. I've worked with um, some of the best in the industry, John Ligazamo, Robert De Niro, Francis McDormand, um, Jerry Lewis, uh, some legends. And, and it, the experience has been, the whole ebb and flow of it has been quite interesting. Um, and uh, uh, back in the early 2000s, um, other opportunities came where I um, went and taught abroad um, to okay. um, developing nations um, at secondary schools, doing theater and drama workshops with young children. And um, I have to say the whole cross-cultural exchange uh, was really a very eye-opening experience and, and um, very enlightening, certainly. So there's been a I guess a, a, a rainbow of opportunities that have come my way. And um, I'm grateful to that. Okay, any uh, future projects uh, coming up or do we have to be surprised? <laughs> uh, honestly, you would have to be surprised. Okay. Yeah, during, well, dur during this pandemic, I have to say, yeah. you know, because it's been, it's been so different with everything being shut down. And right. Stuff. But during right. this pandemic, um, been doing a lot of vocal work, vocal recordings. You could probably be driving on the interstate and you might hear my voice, you know, on a, on a commercial, or, you know, Enbrel anti-inflammatory rheumatoid arthritis medicine. Okay. Um, Walmart. Um, I, I, and, and then doing, embarking upon um, the world of animation as well. Oh, okay. So you, could, you could possibly hear my voice at, at any point in time. Uh, particularly, particularly during this time during the pandemic, that's what I've been doing um, a lot of. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jill, for your t for spending some time with us. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get your father back in into this into the hot seat. Thank you. And <laughs> All thank right. You for your time. Thank you thank for your you. time. Absolutely, absolutely. Doug, you're a great interviewer. You asked the right questions so that. <laughs> So that our hearing and viewing public can uh, yeah. know what what went down, what went on is very very important. 
That center has been in existence since Malcolm started the center in 1958. Yeah. So talk to us about some of the plays and that and programs that you that you put on and participated in in the center. Okay. Can you see this? Do I have to? Can... Yeah, hold it up a little bit more. Like this? Oh, uh, yeah, hold back a little bit. Okay. Okay. Yep, I see it now. This is the beginning of what is now known as the Paul Wilson Theater. Oh, okay. This is the beginning. I brought these folk in. These people are very talented. Professional actors to start the Black Theater. And the theater was called the African Cultural Center Theater. A gentleman by the name of Celeste Tisdale was hired after they fired me. Okay. And Tisdale was there for a hot minute. He wasn't there very long, but he was there long enough to capitalize on the name of the famous great singer actor Paul Robeson. So he, take, he took the name African Cultural Center Theater and named the theater Paul Robeson Theater. And it's been Paul Robeson for years. I think that if it named, it's named anything, it should be named not because I started it, I would rather see it named the Malcolm Ernai Theater because this was Malcolm Ernai's idea and nobody else's. I started the theater, but Tisdale came in there for a hot minute, he wasn't there very long, and changed it to the Paul Robeson Theater, capitalizing off the famous name of that great singer actor. Simple as that. Okay. These are the people. I, can you see these? Am I uh, no, you have to elevate a little bit. I can, I can see. Okay, I can. Okay, yeah, I can see it now. The first well, actor, Jill, Jill, can you read for me? I have a uh, Bill Galano. Okay. Cynthia Belgrade, Chris Kaiser, and Tina Satton. Okay. They are the first directors at the so-called now Paul Robeson Theater. But they started that theater off. We started it off in 19, if you can see the back of the flyer. 19, see that year, Doug? 1971. 1971. And that was the first director was a white man. Here he is right here, my buddy. We just lost him. Can you see his picture close? Uh, nope. Yeah, you have to, you have to lift, lift it up. A little. The guy right there. Yep. You see? You see? Yep, I see it. Okay. Who's that next to him? Cynthia Dogway? Yep. Who's that next to Cynthia? Dad, they can conduct the interview. You ask him. Yeah, that's. They can conduct the interview. I can't see the guy. I mean, I, you already said the guy's name, so I, I, I know who they. And I guess I can see who they are. Okay. Okay. Now, now I remember when we when we talked. Um, you said that they terminated you. And you said that you wanted to speak on it and tell your side of the story. So we'll certainly give you a chance to tell your side and set the record straight. On okay. so what what was it? What was it that led up to your termination? One word, in my opinion. These are my opinions, and nobody's going to change them. Let me just say that I lived the experience, I had the experience, nobody else did. You can go by hearsay all you wanna. I'm telling you the way it happened. We were to have a board meeting. They had had a secret board meeting before the, the, the regular board meeting. I got the particulars on that too. We had had a board meeting. I'm coming out of my office going up to the board meeting, the one where they had planned to fire me, that board meeting was held at the BUILD headquarters. A lot of people remember the BUILD headquarters 
Right. Located there, put a, a, a corner of Main Street and East Union. That's where that, that board meeting was going to be held. Oh, okay. I came out of my office on my way to the board meeting. And Dr. Elizabeth Armstead pulled up in the in the in the parking lot at the African Culture Center, and I'm going to get in the minivan to go to the board meeting. And I said, Dr. Armstead, what where are you with the board meeting? Is that Bill headquarters today? She said, Yes, I know. I just left there. I said, You just left the board meeting? What's what's going on? She said, Come over to the car. I go over to the car. Dr. Armstead, I said, I just resigned. I said, you what? You resigned? What's going on? What do you mean? She said, because they're getting ready to fire you. I said, what? Fire me? For what? What have I done that they should fire me? She says, as far as I'm concerned, you've done nothing. You've done a great job running this center. She said, but my husband warned me about this. She told me to look for trouble. And I said, well, Dr. Armstead, I am so sorry. She said, but uh, I told them that I thought you'd done a fantastic job and that I would resign if they were going to fire you. Now, the person that told her that was a guy named Will Brown. He used to work with Herb Bellamy down there at 1499th of Jefferson Avenue. Will Brown. Will Brown fired me. He was the chairman of the board. I went on up to the board meeting, but before I went to the board meeting, I went back in my office and got my tape recorded and took it with me. And when I got up to the board meeting, Dr. Armstead had resigned. She left. By the way, Dr. Armstead's skin tone was white. A white woman told me that these people were getting ready to fire me. When I got up there, I took my tape recorder and I put it on the table and turned it on. I said, nobody touch that recorder, let it record. Will Brown said, uh, we decided to go in a different direction. You're not being charged with anything. In other words, you haven't done anything. Well, I knew, pardon my expression, I knew damn well I hadn't done anything done my job and loved doing it, teaching kids, teaching black youth their history. I said, now let it play. And it played. And I got so disgusted after that. I said, I don't want to hear anything else. I'm going to have to leave you. I left the meeting. He asked me for the keys. I said, I don't have the keys to the center, but you'll get them. And I left. That was in June of 1976. March of ninth of 2021. You listening, Doug? Mm -hmm. March of 2021. I'm sitting up here in my apartment here in New York City and my phone rang. She said, Mr. Lawrence, you're a young lady. She said, Mr. Lawrence, you don't know me. I said, I don't believe I do. She said, my name is Phyllis Brown. I'm Will Brown's daughter. The man that fired me in June of 1976 had his daughter to call me in 2020, March of 2020. I said, yes, dear, you Mr. Brown's daughter. Okay, well, and I knew right away what it was all about. It took that black man all them years to decide to call and want to apologize for what he had done. True story, Doug. Wow. True story I just told you. And I accepted his apology. I said, but let's hope that the center will stay on track and go on and teach black history. I said, the unfortunate thing is it took you that long to realize. Nothing but jealousy. And guess what the jealousy was? What was it? Me coming there to the board meeting, those kids was all over me like I was their natural father. They loved it. And I loved them back. I hugged them back. That's what was wrong. Jealousy. And that's what's wrong in the black community today. 
jealousy. Jealous of one another for what? Your skin tone is just as black and dark as mine. What are you jealous of? Instead of joining hands and being together, that's why I want the center to get back on court. Get back teaching black history. All right. I want to ask you another question, and I should have asked this before we talked about the termination, uh, but I'll, I'll still ask, certainly ask you because it's significant. Um, you were responsible, the, the last director of record that I was aware of, of course, was Agnes Bain. Mm -hmm. And you were instrumental, you told me, in bringing her in. Can you tell us the story about Agnes Bain and who she was? Before Agnes, there was three other ladies. Uh, Connie, Aunt Connie Scott, Connie Scott, uh, Joyce Godby, Plummer Godby's wife. I don't know if you remember Plummer Godby. Plummer Godby was secretary to the state senator Henry Noah. Okay. Connie Anderson, Miss Wallace, Pauline Wallace was there as a as the secretary when I when I came in. Miss Wallace had to leave because of health reasons. Her husband was a janitor there at the center. And uh, Connie Scott left because she was looking for a type different job. And Joyce Godby left because of Plummer Godby having to relocate from Buffalo down to the Washington, D.C. area because Senator Hank Noack, his boss, had moved his offices down to the Washington, D.C. area. So I needed a, a recording secretary. And one night when I was closing up the center, I don't know how I can remember this as well. It was a Wednesday night. I closed that center that night. And on the way home, I'm going down. We lived out on, uh, on, we lived out on Oak Grove. I'm going home that night. And I stopped in a local pharmacy there on the corner of Wolders and East Ferry. And I went in that store to get my daughter, who you just talked to, Jill. She was like four or five years old, to get us some bubble gum or candy. And when I walked in the store, a young lady came up and she was sitting in the back and she saw me come in. She got up and kind of came forward with a beautiful smile. She said, may I help you, sir? I said, yes. I told her what I was there for. I said, I'd like to get my daughter some candy and bubble gum. She made the sale. I paid her and left, left, going back to my car. True story, what I'm telling you. Everything I've been telling you is true. Absolutely. And I got back to my car. As I was opening the car door, I heard a voice. I heard a voice. And that voice says, Get that smile into the cultural scene. You're going to need it. Did you hear what I said, though? Absolutely. Every word. Every word. The next day, I came back to that pharmacy that same night when I closed the center. And the young lady saw me coming in again. She said, sir, you're back to get some more candy for your daughter? I said, no. I'm back to speak to you. She said, speak to me. I said, yes. I said, do you have any, I said, I need a, we need a recording secretary at the center. Do you have any skills in that area? Or once she said one word, some, S-O-M-E. She said, I have some skills. I said, okay. I said, I'd like you to submit a, re a resume. Would you be willing to submit a, submit a resume to me? She said, yes, I can submit a resume. I said, submit a, a resume. That voice had told me to get that smile into the culture scene. She had that kind of aura and that smile that those kids needed badly. As Ms. Baines came aboard, I told her. I said, I'd like you to take this position. He said, now, Mr. Lawrence, remember I told you I had some skills in the bookkeeping, but I would be willing to learn. Agnes Baines wasn't in the center a month. 
When one evening after work, after the work hour, a white man came in, came up to the counter and asked to speak to the director. Ms. Baines came to the office door. I was sitting in there. He said, Mr. Lawrence, there's a gentleman out here who wants to speak with you. And I went over to the counter and greeted the gentleman. He says, can you use a bookkeeper? Did you hear what I said, Doug? Uh, can you use a bookkeeper? Wow. And his skin was white as snow. White man. Mm. I hired him on the spot. Because I listened to God. I said, how soon can you start? He says, I'll probably finish out the week where I'm at now. I'll start. He trained Agnes Bain to be one of the best big bookkeepers on the planet. His name was Fred Ringe. His wife's name was Jean, Jean Ringe. What a pleasure to meet those two people. And he trained Agnes. He was there for about three or four years, maybe not that long. But anyway, she, she became one of the best bookkeepers on the planet. And after I left the center, she drifted away from bookkeeping. She ran into some more people who, con who convinced her to do the books of other organizations and she could make some nice money. Agnes bought her a nice home. She got away from teaching black history. That's the only flaw that I could see because Agnes Baines was like an angel sent by God. She got away from teaching black history. Big mistake. She got away. She started doing the Pine Grill reunions. The, uh, the uh, musicians would come in, jazz musicians. So she drifted away and she started working with the guy that just lost being mayor there in Buffalo, Byron Brown. They started working together. So it looked like black history being taught went right out the door. And I'm in the business of bringing it back in the door. And guess where all the black history is? Can you guess, Doug? Where is it at? In computers. In yeah. computers. Yeah. And guess what, Doug? What is it? I don't think any white, I don't think any black man had any any business about inventing computers. But that's where the black history is. Yeah. And the African Culture Center should be full of computers. And I was gonna ask you, are you in in contact or in touch with everything with what's going on with because the African Cultural Center still stands today? Are you in touch with anything that there that's going on there now? Thanks for asking, because if you hadn't asked, I was going to tell you. I sent them a congratulatory letter and told them about my background and that if there's anything that I could do that would help, I'd be glad to. Okay. So... I never got an answer. Wow. Let me say it again. I sent that lady congratulatory letter and offered this, my services, my advice, to help the center get back on track. Never got an answer. And was cold when I, when, 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 when I said cold, wasn't friendly when we talked to her. I don't know what that's all about. Oh, okay. The only thing, when I'm fighting right now with this documentary film, is to get some justification. I would love to be put in charge again. I'm certainly too old to be the director again. I don't, I don't mean that at all. I would love to have the authority to bring the right people in. And that's very important. To have the right people. There are a lot of us are black in skin tone only. Okay? We're mm -hmm. black in skin tone only. There are a lot of us, and they were some of them were on that board that given didn't give a damn about those black kids learning their history. They were there for other reasons. 
it's not good enough to come into a place like the African Cultural Center and offer your services as a board member because it's, the, the work that's being done there is too important for the youth. You can't come in and want to meet other people on the board and further your own individual cause. That's what I saw. That's true. So we got to keep moving, man. Absolutely. Now, in closing, um, in your own words, just for your, it's certainly speaking for your own, the era that you that your that you were there. Uh, what do you think is what are your your view is the importance of the African Cultural Center to the Buffalo community? The importance is we were brought here. Black people were brought to this country on slave ships in chains. The non-blacks were brought to this country on a ship called the Mayflower. The Mayflower. We ought to be proud of who we are. And my mother, she drilled that in us. That's why she told me to go down there to that center and help Malcolm Earn and I start a theater, black theater, if we want to go down, that's where you belong. Go in the bathroom, look, at, look in the mirror. And when you look in that mirror, you ain't going to see no white. You're going to see skin tone. My mother, she said, you get down there and work with Malcolm. We love everybody because we're all human beings. But you're supposed to work with Malcolm Earn and I. And guess what, Doug? When I went back to the Studio Arena Theater, White Theater on Main Street, professional theater, and spoke to Neil Dubrock. He was the one that brought, brought me out of the steel plant into the theater and into the theater school. I told Neil Dubrock what, I'm, what I was going to do. Man, they, they rolled out the carpet and helped me all the way. Helped me all the way. And that's how the Paul Robeson Theater came about. Absolutely. Glennis Green, she was a center's choreographer. She taught those kids how to dance. But then when I came aboard and brought in the theater, she also did some acting. Wonderful acting. Wonderful acting. And she worked at the post office. Her name is Glennis Green. Oh, okay. She's listening now. Or her relatives or friends. I would like to send Glennis a message. Okay. Glennis, I'm sorry I had to terminate you because you were working two jobs. You were working in the post office and working at the center as a court owner. I'm glad I had to terminate I had to uh, terminate you, but I wish that I went another route. Maybe we could have sat down and worked it out. Ronnie Latham took your place, but maybe we could have worked some, something out. Mr. Lawrence could send his apologies to you right now. I love you, girl. I hope you don't hate me. I love you. I always have. Glenn, I'm sorry I had to terminate you. Well, Mr. Lawrence, it was certainly a honor and a pleasure to have you a part of the, uh, to have you join us for the Buffalo History Channel to share this great piece of Buffalo history with us. Well, let me say this. With regards to you, I'm just meeting you. I know you're on the right track, and I know you're one of the black men that we need. We need. Because when I called you and told you about my daughter, maybe wanting to say something, and Jasper Magruder maybe wanting to say something, you did not say what I thought you might would say. I thought you might would say, Mr. Lawrence, I'm sorry, but I... This interview has to be between you and me. No, you said that just the opposite. Bring him in, Mr. Lawrence. We'd love to hear from him. We're on the right track with you, buddy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're, and we're going to stay together. Let's try and help the center get back on the right track. Absolutely. The only track for that center because of what Malcolm and I did and started. The only track for the African American Cultural Center in Buffalo is teaching black history. 
Everything else is secondary. Teaching those kids to be proud of their skin tone and who they are. Let's get busy. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me.